what do you make from like a profit margin or something like that? It's about 85% profit margin. You still can operate with an 85% profit margin. Correct. Because there's just not a big market for it. Well, there's there's not. It, it's a, it's definitely a niche service, but you got to think too, it's, it's also something that, that a lot of people don't want to do which means that you can charge a premium for it. Why do a lot of people not want to do it? Is it just because... It's disgusting. It's disgusting <laughs> and nasty? Yeah. All right, guys. Bang, bang. I thought a great place to start this conversation would be the economics of a crime scene, which sounds absolutely absurd, but literally your business, you guys go in after a crime has occurred, after the police have done all their work, you got to clean it up. Someone's got to do this. Uh, but it's a business. You're an entrepreneur. How should we think about what the actual economics of the crime scene are? Like when you guys get the phone call and you're like, there's a murder or a crime at X address, what happens? Yeah, I mean, the uh, the easy ones are somebody died in the bed, decomposed. That's pretty easy, cut and dry. The harder ones are, you know, granny died on the third floor and melted through the second floor and is dripping into somebody else's bathroom on the second floor. How does that happen? That's because she was just left Unattended, there for a while? Unattended, yeah, left there for a while. Nobody checked on her, so she just decomposed, and we've literally had a melt through floors before. So that's, you know, a big, big crime scene. And we're using the term crime scene, but is it always a crime? Or could it yeah. actually just be natural death, or, or uh, is it a murder? Yeah, I kind of use that play? term as an umbrella, really. Okay. Um, it. We, most of the cleanups that we do, I would say, are unattended deaths. Okay. And you get called to come do one of these cleanups. Uh -huh. uh, do you go with like a clipboard and you check out the scene and then you call back and you're like, okay, here's what we need. Do you guys show up with like a cleaning truck? Like how do you arrive on scene? So every truck is outfitted to clean up any type of biohazard scene okay. at any time. So you're ready to go. We have a two-hour response time. We're there. We're ready no matter what. So... Um, that is advantageous, obviously, because it's a sense of urgency for people. Mm -hmm. And how do you think about pricing, right? Like, yeah. uh, it's not exactly I'm going to the grocery store and I got like a price tag on, on the uh, product. It's not Amazon. I don't think people are going on and clicking some buttons. Uh, when they call, do they try to describe to you what the scene is and you just quote them a price? Is it a monopoly where like they pretty much call you and you just send them a bill for whatever you think it's worth later? How does that work? It's a little bit of all of the above. Okay. So there's no, uh, like you said, um, kind of market for this type of thing. So what we do is um, we try to be, we're not the most expensive, but we're also nowhere near the, the cheapest. Um, so what we do is we utilize software to kind of tell us based on the different markets that we're in, what the average going rate is for a particular labor or replacing subfloor, you know, personal protective equipment. There's a line item for literally everything. Mm -hmm. So um, I really never quote over the phone. I always kind of go to the scene because there's so many things that you can't see especially someone that's calling on the phone. You know, they're like, I looked at it for two seconds. I don't want to be in there. I, it's on the floor. And I'll even say, what kind of floor is it? And they'll go, I don't remember. Mm -hmm. Like they're so kind of traumatized by it that I'll say, oh, listen, I'll just come by and take a look at it. Mm -hmm. And it takes me kind of two seconds to say, yep, it went through the drywall or, you know, it's mm -hmm. when you've been doing it. Long How many enough. times are you getting called by like a family or a relative, a friend, something like that versus like you're getting called by the government, whether it's law enforcement or, or somebody like that? I would say 99% by the family. Maybe, by the family? Yeah, maybe 1% by okay, the Okay, so government. most of the clients are actually like private clients. They're not actually the government. Right, correct. Mm -hmm. And when you get on scene, uh, what are you doing? Is this like somebody comes to clean your apartment or your house and like they kind of show up, they got some supplies, <laughs> they, you know, work yeah. their way around? Or is there something that uh, has to take into account the actual, you know, there's a dead body? Uh, yeah. So what do you do? So the body is typically always removed. Okay. Um, there's been maybe less than 10 cases where I got there quick enough to where the body was still there. Mm -hmm. um, and those are just kind of, wow, you know, kind of takes you back, especially when it's like a shotgun suicide or something. There's just parts everywhere. Um, so you're just essentially you're doing the opposite of what like a Molly maid would do. A Molly maid, you know, if they were in this room, they'd probably start vacuuming from there and vacuum their way out. We're cleaning from the door in. So we're not cross contaminating. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So you know, you're you're literally just going item by item and the attention to detail is so precise on it. So it's not like, oh my God, I forgot to, you know, dust the lamp. It it doesn't work that way. It's like, mm -hmm. hey, you left a tooth behind. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, so it it's kind of catastrophic to make a mistake like that. You mm -hmm. want to be extremely thorough. 
what do you do with the materials after you get done cleaning up? Like, let for example, uh, there's a tooth or there mm-hmm. is, you know, other things that have been left behind. What do you do? They get bagged, red bagged, and then they get autoclaved. What is which that is, mean? it kind of looks like a submarine, but it's uh, essentially a giant microwave. It heats it up to about 330 degrees, somewhere around there. Uh, some of them will have a shredder attached to them. Mm-hmm. Some don't. So it just gets essentially heated. So the, where the point of any disease would be dead, non-viruses. And then it just goes into a normal landfill, believe it or not. Wow. Yeah. All right. How much do you charge for this? So it varies per job, but it, in general, it's probably about seven to eight hundred dollars an hour. Okay. And what do you make from like a profit margin on something like that? It's about eighty five percent profit margin. So even though you have physical labor, you have cleaning supplies, you have uh, you know vehicles, you have all these different things that most people would associate with a kind of a small business in the real world, kind of the atoms not bits world, you still can operate with an eighty five percent profit margin, correct? Because there's just not a big market for it. Well, there's there's not. It, it's a, it's definitely a niche service, but you got to think too. It's it's also something that, that a lot of people don't want to do, which means that you can charge a premium for it. Mm-hmm. And. Why do a lot of people not want to do it? Is it just because it's disgusting, it's disgusting and nasty? <laughs> yeah, I mean it's disgusting. I I think it the physical fitness required uh, for it is uh, really the primary thing why we lose employees. Maybe they they just can't physically handle it. Most people think, oh, they must be just emotionally wrecked by it. And actually, that's never been an issue. It's always been the physical. You're wearing personal protective equipment, a full respirator. It feels like you're breathing out of a straw. Sometimes you're in attics cleaning up people's brains. You're working with power tools. It's just a very uncomfortable, sweaty, hot, nasty environment. Why are you working with power tools? Uh, we're cutting up subfloors. We're cutting drywall. Uh, sometimes we're cutting beds and you know just a bunch of different things apart. Anything that's been contaminated has to go. So really, not only are you guys cleaning, you actually are deconstructing things. Oh, absolutely. Right? If, if they've been contaminated. Right. Do you also participate in like what I would consider more like general contracting work of like rebuilding? We subcontract that out. Okay. To somebody else. Yeah. All right. How big is your business? Uh, we did about 12 million last year. We'll do about between 16 and 18 million this year. And where do you get customers from? <laughs> <laughs> Are they just Googling? Uh, yeah, essentially you get, uh, you get a lot from online presence. Um, we've got a lot of national contracts. Um, you got to think that, you know, property management, thousand, two thousand people under one roof essentially. A lot of stuff happens in apartments. Mm-hmm. A lot of stuff happens in hotels. So, you know, we kind of try to target our marketing to the bigger vendors, the B2B. Mm-hmm. And when you do let's call it sixteen to eighteen million dollars, how mm-hmm. much of that is in one single market versus is actually, you know, nationally across uh evenly split these different Yeah, cities? that's spread out over thirty three markets. Okay. Yeah. And you have full time employees in each one of those markets, or yes. you're contracting out and and we have of... franchises in each location. Okay. Yeah. And how do you pick those franchisees? Not very well. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. That's uh yeah that's a science that I would definitely say I've not mastered. It's it's a difficult thing to pick the right franchisee for a particular brand. What is the uh, worst case scenario that you've had with a franchisee? We would need another podcast to go over all I, that. We have yeah. all the time in the world. I would you know, love to hear this. Um, we've had, I mean, we've had them lie, cheat, steal pretty much across the board. Um, we've had one that just kind of, they, a, lot of a lot of them have this uh, notion that they, they, they buy into a franchise and they're just going to sit on the couch and wait for the phone to ring. And- that's not the case at all. Like the, the, the point is it's, it's business in a box, but you still have to work. Like mm-hmm. we, we don't go down there for you. So, you know, we've had, um, evasion of royalties where they'll, uh, try to take cash on the side. Um, they'll, uh, God, it's, it's just endless. We've, we had one that failed out and became a prostitute. Um, that's a interesting strategy. Yeah, very interesting. You know, uh, how did you figure that out? Uh, she told somebody, she told somebody the business isn't working. I'm now a prostitute. Well, she can't. She can't run a business, so she's just gonna sell her ass, essentially. Interesting. Yeah. Was yeah. she successful at that? I don't know. Yeah. I, I don't get royalties from that part. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> also, I guess you kind of only have to manage yourself at that. Yeah. Point. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, 
Maybe it's know, an easier business. What are, that's a higher profit margin, I would assume. Yeah, that is uh, interesting. How does the uh, franchise work? What do they have to pay to buy a franchise? And then how do you structure the royalties? So it's it's uh, pretty inexpensive considering you know franchises as a whole. It's about le- it's less than one hundred and sixty thousand. They pay eight percent royalties and a three percent national brand fund. It's not that bad. No, not at all. Yeah, I mean, what what do you think the national average for franchises is? Probably like three hundred to five. Well, I mean, you've got the high end like McDonald's, three three four million just to get in, and mm-hmm. you don't even own the land. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you've got home base type businesses that are less than 50 grand so Mm -hmm. you know it's really i don't i wouldn't know what the kind of the average is yeah so you guys will do 160 and how much of that is via owned and operated uh you know locations i guess or or like cities versus the franchises they're all uh franchise operated they're all franchise operated okay correct uh what has been good about the franchise strategy it gave us the ability to so one let me back up a little bit so one of the biggest issues when I first started the business all the way back in 2005 was everyone said the same thing. We didn't know anybody did this. We thought the police did it. So I thought the police did exactly. it until you sat down in that chair. Exactly. Well, I was a police officer prior to that, and I didn't even know who did it. So what does that tell you? So I knew I had a huge hurdle to overcome. Mm-hmm. So by us franchising and kind of spreading our geographic you know, abilities there, we're able to reach more people so that they don't have to do this themselves. Mm-hmm. And that's it, what people were doing previously. Yeah, either that or, you know, uh, hiring unqualified people to do it and maybe just not getting it all and then wondering what that smell is, you know, mm-hmm. two months later. That's crazy. Yeah, that's sad. So how did how did you start? So I was in law enforcement for seven years. And, uh, like a went, beat cop or something else? Yeah, I did beat. I did undercover narcotics, mm-hmm. undercover prostitution. Mm-hmm. And, uh, What's that like? Which part? Both the narcotics and the prostitution. The prostitution was fun. Narcotics, not so much. It, why was it fun? Um, you just get to screw with guys and try to lure, lure them into a situation. Well, you, I mean, that's the part that was. It was like shooting fish in a barrel. You didn't have to lure anything. <laughs> you're, I mean, it was like, are you? It's kidding like, how does me? it work? Like, you're just go stand on the street. Corner? No, yeah. So there's a couple different types of stings. Uh, the particular one that I did was street. Mm-hmm. Um, where you're literally, we would go into an area that was known for heavy prostitution. We would kick out the real prostitutes, mm-hmm. make them go to a different area, and then we would take their place, essentially. Mm-hmm. And, and if you guys know that it's known for prostitution, people in the area know it's is. for prostitution. Yeah. And I swear to God, I mean, within 30 minutes, it looked like a Chick-fil-A line. They were just lined up. There was uh, probably two of us on one corner, two of us on the other corner, and they could hardly keep up with arresting all of them. Like it was that. No way. It was insane. And so, what the guys pull up? What's the conversation? Um, they would say, um, "How much for a blowjob?" Oh, they you would know. just straight up ask. Oh, yeah. Like, there's no c- code language. They're getting nothing. right to the yeah, right yeah. to the point. Yeah, 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 right to the point. And and then you back then it was cheap. Oh, like how much? Twenty bucks for a blowjob. I don't know who we should be judging more on that side of the market. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so exactly. twenty dollars for a blowjob. Yep. Then does the officer get in the car? No. No. That's the key. You never get in the car. Okay. Why? Well, I mean, you're a sitting duck if you get in the car because there's right. security concerns. Right. So concerns. I say, hey, I'll meet you around the corner. I don't want anybody to see me getting in your car. And then they would go around the corner, and a three hundred pound burly man would meet them. <laughs> yeah. And all of a sudden, twenty dollars doesn't matter anymore. Exactly. Yeah. Got it. And uh, what are the types of people? That are doing you know, this. this was shocking to me, okay? Because I Maybe was not. 23 at the time. I, I watched a lot of cops. So. Okay, so <laughs> I was 23. I was very naive. Okay. And I thought... You thought it was like drug addicts and stuff? That's what I thought. Yeah. I thought this was just going to be... Oh my God, was I wrong? White collar? Total white collar. Yeah. Every once in a while, you'll get the roofer or, mm-hmm. or something on their way home. Um, we got an FBI agent on duty in his FBI vehicle. Nah, come on. I swear to God. Hold on a second. On his wait, lunch wait, wait, break. Rewind, on his rewind, lunch break. Rewind, rewind, rewind. This is during the day. During the day, you were doing a prostitution sting as a beat police officer, undercover, yep. and an FBI agent on duty in his car on his lunch break pulled up and tried to get a blowjob? Oh, no. He wanted around the world, so he knew he'd done it before. And he was in his 60s. Yeah. What is that conversation like once he gets arrested? He looked like <laughs> someone had shot his mother. Like he, he literally got out of the car, pulled out his badge, 
and he just like put his head down and he knew his life was over. Yeah. That was it. And, and his life was over. Because he loses his full retirement. He he gets fired. He's probably divorced. I yeah. mean, you name it. His whole life is over. Over a forty dollar bang. Literally on his lunch break. That's just what I call good judgment. Yeah. <laughs> Something <laughs> like that. All right. What about the narcotics things? Narcotic, By the way, just so you know, I yeah. break down the economics of a lot of stuff on this show. I've never can, broken down the economics of prostitution Well, things, you know, we can talk we about the profit margins because they're excellent. Okay, explain. Um, well, I mean, you know, $20 <laughs> for a blowjob, it takes five minutes, so do the math. <laughs> <laughs> five minutes if, 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 if he's any good, anyway. So the narcotics is a bit different because uh, I worked in uh, Kansas City's worst neighborhoods. So being Caucasian was actually a big disadvantage. Uh, for me. So we were buying a majority of crack, cocaine, mm -hmm. um, a little bit of weed and meth. So, but crack by far was, mm -hmm. was the drug of choice. At and you're that in point. your uh, young twenties, you said doing yeah, this? Yeah, I was okay. 25. Okay. And time. is it strategic that they're using you because you're a woman, because you're young, a combination because you're white? Like, Well, the prostitution was very strategic. It's okay. because I'm a woman. So they would essentially go to all female officers and say, Who's interested in, <laughs> in overtime? And I'm like, hey, I'm a glutton for punishment. I'll fucking yeah. try it. So, um, but I, I didn't realize how much work it would be. Mm -hmm. Like you, you would think, you know, hey, I'm standing on the corner. This is easy, you know, but it was like a fucking Chick-fil-A line. Like, but like it was insane. It, when you say it's a lot of work, is that because you then have to go back and do all the police reports? No, I didn't that? have no. to do any of that. Though okay. It was a lot of work because of the volume. So literally you're trying to make a deal with a guy and have him go around the corner and you're seeing the next guy that's coming up and trying not to fuck yourself because he's going around the corner and you're supposed to be following. You know what I'm saying? So it's, it's very strategic on mm -hmm. how you're making this deal, but you're also undercover. You're, mm -hmm. you're not letting them know. Cause I didn't ever did the busting. There was guys waiting for them when they went yep. around the corner. Yep. And then around the corner, basically you was a SWAT team. Yeah, and you don't want the people in line. Exactly, to see the corner. you got it. So you, got you it. almost have to like slow your roll a little bit. A little bit. So yeah. we, I was with a, another female officer, and we would kind of play off of each other. Like I would lean into one car, she would lean into the other, and yep. then we would, you know, send them to a different. And corner. do you have a gun with you? While no, you're doing this, no gun, no wire. Yeah. So basically, you're kind of out on your own. Oh yeah. And basically, there's another officer there, but neither one of you. Oh, have they're a around gun. the corner. You, you have other officers, oh, she but I'm saying, yeah, she, she didn't have anything you either. There I mean, yeah, you're you're wearing, you know, and that's another kind of misnomer that oh, you're supposed to dress all sexy and stuff. We dressed like we were fucking homeless. Really? Oh yeah, like oversized clothes. Um, I put black out on my teeth. It's a, um, it looks like nail polish, but it's black. Okay. When you put it on your teeth, it looks like you have no tooth in that particular area, because it's, <laughs> yeah. So the more gross you look, the more that they believe that you weren't a cop oh uh, that was that was yeah Are they that worried was, about cops being out there or not yeah because really? they would they would always say this is another big misnomer so for everybody that's looking for prostitutes out there i'm helping you out hey hey, hey <laughs> boys listen up all right <laughs> listen up i'm helping you out so they would always go if i ask you if you're a cop you have to tell me right and i'm like yeah i'm not a cop that's a biggest you misnomer you ever want. you can say whatever the fuck you want yeah I don't what? know where they're getting that from. Well, probably because they watched uh, TV or TV something. Yeah. Or stayed at a Hampton. Magnum Inn. PI or some shit. Yeah. I don't know, but that's not true. And so you could just say whatever you wanted. Yeah. How I could say I'm a fucking rocket scientist. Yeah. How do you think about, um, what do they call it, uh, entrapment? Like I, I used to watch like, uh, I remember uh, I would watch cops and they would always have this one thing. It was like in Boston. I don't know why if they thought idiots were in Boston or what was going on. <laughs> you know, hey, Boston, whatever. Yeah, yeah. But uh, they would put uh, a bicycle out on the sidewalk. And they wouldn't chain it up mm. and they would be up like in a, you know, a office building or a hotel or whatever. And they had a little binoculars on mm -hmm. within 20 seconds. Someone goes by, grabs of a bicycle, course. jumps on, hops off, and then they right. would go and they, and they would get them. Right. Uh, and it was like, again, Chick-fil-A line, like literally just oh, do yeah. it all day long. Oh yeah. Like, all day long. Uh, and people would always be like, that's entrapment. It's not. Okay. What, like, where is the, uh, like what is entrapment and what isn't entrapment? So what I had to do was. I just had to get them to agree to a sexual act for a monetary value. Mm -hmm. And it didn't have to be cash. Mm -hmm. One guy offered me a Whopper. <laughs> I'm like, you broke fuck. Okay, whatever. It's a Whopper. He still gets arrested. Yep. So 
it's any type of negotiation that sex for monetary value. Yep. So when they come up and they say, hey, you want a party? Well, that could be taken in any way. And I'll say, sure, what do you want? And they'll go, well, what do you do? Like they're trying to dance around it. And I'll say, blowjob's 20, fuck's 40. Yep. And then they'll go, all right, I'll take the blowjob. Bam, there you go. Got it. So you can even offer. Oh, I can say whatever, but they have to agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, it's like this weird thing, right, where uh, there is the monetary value. And I guess, like, they didn't actually commit the act, but they committed the negotiation. That's the it. Act. It's just a nego- Yeah, because I'm not getting in the car. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, like, that's the whole thing, right, is, like, I guess also there's probably people. I'm thinking of, like, the hardcore uh, libertarian audience would argue, like, they didn't actually do it. Yeah, I can see your point. Right. But the, and so the, like, the way the law is written is it's the agreement of the negotiation. Yeah. But, you know, after doing this for several years, I'm like, why the fuck are we doing this? This is just such a waste of taxpayer money. Really? Like, legalize the shit out of it. Pay your taxes. Go buy it. Have your diseases tested and have a nice day. Like, why yeah. the fuck am I on the corner here trying to catch, you know, the white collar guy on his lunch break? Yeah. It just well, seems mute. You how, know? how much of it is uh, where there's prostitution, there's other things going on? That was that's the or no. the law. That's okay. what they that's would what say. They, that's what they would. That's say. what they would say. Is it? It's a precursor. I don't know if I buy that. I yeah. would say that's that's hard for me to wrap my head around. It really is. You know, I, I got a 60, 70 year old man with his wife in the car. No. Will you fuck us both? I'm like, yeah, sure. No way. Yeah. A 60 or 70-year-old And he's year hooked up man. to fucking oxygen at the time. No way. Yeah. I'm like, dude, I'll kill you. Is that... <laughs> <laughs> is, is that like a, uh, uh, that I guess a like first. a bucket list uh, oh, yeah. item or that something? Oh, yeah. That was a total bucket. That, the FBI guy, that's a bucket list. The Whopper, that's definitely a bucket list. Yeah. Like the 60, 70-year-old guy, mm-hmm. you almost kind of kind of feel like, hey, man, like, what's yeah. up with this? He's like, hey, I'm dying. Like, yeah. He's probably like... I want, I want but his wife was with him. And what was she saying? Does she get in oh. trouble for that? Uh, they both got arrested, yeah. Because she solicited it as well. Yeah. Damn. I know. Imagine not But even... at her age, she's probably like, ah, fuck it. You yeah, know? but still, that's kind of crazy. Yeah. All right, and so what's going on with the narcotics stuff? So the narcotics is uh, a lot more dangerous. Um, you have a gun now? Still no gun, no wire. Okay. So when I first started in, in narcotics, you have a choice. If you carry a gun and it gets discovered, you're likely going to get killed. 100%. If you wear a wire and you get discovered, you're likely going to get killed. So what's your choice? Mm-hmm. It was like, okay, fuck it. I won't take either. Mm-hmm. So I never I never carried either. Mm-hmm. Um, and you're by yourself or you have other people with you? Um, both. So we would run in partners, but I would go into ho- crack houses by myself. Mm-hmm. He would go into crack houses by himself. Mm-hmm. When we did street buys, we would just drive around and street buy together. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's a little bit of combination. So a street buy, let's just go in uh, reverse here. So a street buy, you're basically driving around in a car. It's you and another person in the car. Uh, you're both police officers, and you just pull up. There's somebody standing on the side of the oh, street yeah, or whatever. they're obvious. You can tell who's dealing. And Yeah. Because they're basically walking but not going anywhere. Mm-hmm. Uh, and as you pull up, you're just, hey, you know, I want a baggie of whatever. Mm-hmm. And they tell you a price. You hand them money. And then you guys are arresting no, or you pull off? No, we're not at all. We never break our cover. Yep. We pull off. Um, if we're doing street bust, then we'll, bu- they'll bust them right there. But mm-hmm. many times we'll just continue to buy from them and make a case. Mm-hmm. And when you guys are doing this, is it like you pull off and they immediately arrest them? Cause doesn't yes. that kind of tip them off that yeah. like you were the cops or no? Uh, yeah, but they're but, selling like Chick-fil-A. Yeah. So it's, it's, there's no shortage of buyers, put it that way. So yeah. sometimes they get it, sometimes they don't, but. You know, it's a decent sized city and I'm buying all over the place. Mm-hmm. Now, are you targeting the drug dealers or the drug buyers or both? Uh, dealers. The dealers. Usually. Dealers. Yeah. yeah. Which, again, you know, I had this come to Jesus. It's futile. It really is. This is why I, I just don't believe you're ever going to make a dent in the drug trade. Uh, it's a waste of taxpayer money. If these people, you know, if if you have people in those economic conditions, they're going to do whatever it takes to survive. Mm-hmm. I would probably do the same if I grow up in that in that environment. Mm-hmm. So if that's what it is, then that's what it is. Mm-hmm. I mean, you have a supply and demand issue. Mm-hmm. You're never going to change that. I yeah. just I think it's a waste of taxpayer dollars. And so, what should the government do? Let legalize it all. Just legalize Tax all the, the drugs. Tax the fuck out of it. Yeah. 
and yep. like 50% tax? Yeah, 50% tax. Like just the bigger number, the better. Then you're not going to have the fentanyl issue. Explain why. Because fentanyl is being cut into different things, you know. Um, and by cut, you mean basically uh, diluted down using. Yeah, I'm sorry. Things. Yeah. So for people that, you know, if you're buying Coke, you, you're you probably. For, for all of you <laughs> drug addicts, you're good. You understand. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But for everybody else, here's what cut yeah, means. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Here's what cut means. When you're buying Coke, it might not be 100% Coke. It's probably got some fentanyl in it. So when you have these rocket scientists, make, you know, cutting it with fentanyl, they don't know how much fentanyl is too much. How much, you know, and that there's a lot of people dying and mm -hmm. they don't even realize they're taking fentanyl. Mm -hmm. And that's probably one of the bigger problems right now. Across I would the agree. Country. Yeah. Yeah. I would agree. The, um, uh, there's a corridor in the Northeast mm -hmm. where, uh, for probably 2000s, 2010s, there was tons and tons of Percocets and kind of all yeah. the, the pain Oxys pills and everything and that. that was yeah. all running through there. Um, and now, uh, there's still some of it, mm -hmm. but fentanyl has become the drug of choice. It is. Uh, and it, it's interesting to watch the trends change. Uh, but the problem is, you know, yes, you can overdose on some of that other stuff, but not nearly as easily as you could accidentally take some fentanyl. Oh yeah. Uh, Just a granule will kill you. Yeah. Pretty yeah. crazy. Do you think China is, uh, pumping that into the United States? Absolutely. And it's a way to kind of eat away at us from internal. Mm -hmm. It's pretty smart. I mean, yeah. Unfortunately. If. It is smart because if you give Americans a surplus of anything, they will overconsume. I love talking to my European friends because they're <laughs> always like, yo, big gulp. Yeah, <laughs> right? exactly. Like, right? Yo, we ain't got that in, yeah. in Europe. Everything's 10 times the size, right? <laughs> like, you guys are savages our, over here. Our cars, our houses, <laughs> our drinks, our food plates, everything is like 10 times the size. Yeah. Yeah. But the human body can still only handle so much drugs. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So when you're doing uh, all those drug busts and everything, how much is the government spending on this stuff? A shit ton. Yeah. So we have confidential informants, and that how was, much they get paid? Yeah. You know, at that this was back in 2000. Okay. So um, my informant was getting, uh, we called it a hand to hand. She was getting forty dollars per hand to hand, which means she's literally from the dealer's hand to her hand is forty bucks. Every time that a dealer hands her drugs, uh -huh. she's she, getting $40 in her pocket. Yep. She was, at the end of the could, day, making more than me. Yeah, she could probably do that a couple times every she, 20 minutes. Oh, God, yeah. She just did it. She would go run with us two days a week, eight-hour shifts, and she was making double what I was making salary. And I'm like, what the fuck? That's crazy. Yeah. and then Who sets that price at the time? I, the department, I guess. Yeah. I have no they idea. They just tell you we guys. We paid her in uh, unregistered cash. cash, yes. Unregistered cash. Yeah, so the cash that we use to buy deals is always photocopied. Uh -huh. The serial numbers are always traced because then when we bust you and we pull it out of your pocket, we know you can't is. say, well, I didn't do it. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. But the unregistered cash, you guys would give the her. informants. Yeah. And in cash, is she paying uh, income tax on that? Shit, come on now, <laughs> come on now. So the government is paying confidential informants uh cash and then they're not paying taxes on yeah. it yeah maybe if we tax the confidential informants we could get the national debt down or maybe if we don't have to have them at all <laughs> we can get the national debt down I mean, I'm just throwing maybe ideas we tax out. the dope yeah. we can get we can uh get the debt down i mean that probably actually would put a dent into well, some it did. issue california is no longer in debt mm -hmm. i mean not california colorado i'm sorry is no longer in debt yeah it's interesting yeah all right. And so when you're doing this, at what point are you like, all right, I'm done with the prostitution and the drug dealing? Not that you were doing it, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Hey, guys, what's going on? I hope that you're enjoying this conversation. I wanted to interrupt for a second to tell you about an event that we're hosting on March 4th at the Miami Beach Convention Center. It's called Lyceum Miami. And I've gone and asked some of the most popular guests from this show over the years to come in person at the event. It's gonna be awesome. We have everyone from Kathy Wood to Vivek Ramaswamy, Chris Williamson, Cody Sanchez, and many, many others. I also even have a couple of surprises for each one of you if you show up. The best part about this event is it is completely free to attend. That's right, all general admission tickets are free. You simply need to go to LyceumMiami.com. LyceumMiami.com will get you free tickets on March 4th at the Miami Beach Convention Center. And if you're a big baller and don't just want to get a free ticket, you can also get a VIP or an insider pass. If you use the code POMP40, you'll get 40% off. They get you all kinds of cool things like the night before, a cocktail with the actual speakers and a couple other perks. 
Go check it all out at LyceumMiami.com and use code POMP40 if you want to be a baller. I can't wait to see all of you there. Go ahead and click on the link in the description and let's get back into this conversation. The drug dealing was, it was one of those come to Jesus moments where, you know, um, I had some pretty close calls. What was the closest one? You know, I got robbed once. Um, I mean, I, that's a gangster right there, robbing the police. Well, they didn't know I was the I police, know. but yeah. Um, I was swapping out cars almost on every two or three days just to not, trying to change my appearance, you know, just constantly trying you know once you work the same area over and over again uh you don't want people to get it but you know i had a gun pulled on me in a crack house you know when you're walking into a crack house these people are desperate mm -hmm. and they're all in line waiting for their rock what goes on in the crack house uh they're typically it's interesting it's like going to the fucking dmv everybody's just sitting there looking at each other waiting for their turn and that's that's the way it was and the dealer would always go in the back because they, they never want you to know where they're hiding the dope. Mm. But my job was to act like I'm a dope addict, but I'm literally counting every step that I'm making. If there's stairs, I have to count that amount of stairs. I have to remember if I see a dog, if I see children, if I see any fortification whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Like th there's like a lot of, you know, uh, visual memory that I have to do. And then I have to debrief that I'm, I'm writing it down as soon as I get back because once they do go, go bust this you know if I say you know the door is purple and it was a fucking duplex and the door was actually red that's a big deal you know mm -hmm. we just busted the wrong house and that that is a big big deal it's a lawsuit I could lose my job you know there's mm -hmm. just a lot involved in well, it basically what you're doing is you're gathering intelligence yeah, but it's so precise. How many stairs did I walk up? Did mm -hmm. the guy have braids? Did you know how tall was he? How much mm -hmm. did you think he weighed? You didn't see where he got the dope. Did you see which direction in the house he went to? Mm -hmm. You know, I've had him pull it out of their gum line before. Mm -hmm. I've had him pull it out of their ass, mm -hmm. literally, mm -hmm. in their butt cheeks. I've had him pull it out of the freezer in the ice cube trays. I mean, you name it. Yeah. But I have to really remember that while I'm also paying attention to 12 crackheads next to me trying not to fucking stab me or rob me. Yeah. And when you're doing this uh, and you go back and you debrief, I'm assuming it's the SWAT team or, or the DEA or whoever, uh, are they then practicing and kind of running dry runs? They do it one dry run. So they'll go by and I have to count how many houses from the curb it, or how many houses from the uh, corner street it was. Mm -hmm. They'll literally count it, verify it. Um, if they're confused in any way, they'll put me in an unmarked van. Mm -hmm. with Drive tinted windows and they'll say are you sure that was the house and i'll be like yeah you know thank god i never made any errors mm -hmm. and then uh you're not with them when they go do the bust no yeah, yeah. no uh Far and away. <laughs> were you ever in a crack house when a bust went down no no so basically you go in you're getting the uh intelligence you're getting the drugs you're con you know um kind of completing a buy you leave yeah. And then from there, they're I mean, going I've to had dogs it. chase me, the pit bulls, you know, from, oh, man. I mean, it's. I think a lot of people don't realize that the generalizations around crack houses, drug dealers, you know, the dogs, uh, where they hide the drugs, watch any movie. Like, it all oh, comes from Oh, it's fucking reality. realistic. Yeah, yeah, yeah it comes yeah. from reality. I mean, yeah. the, these TV producers are doing their due diligence. Mm -hmm. No question. There was a show on A&E years ago uh, where they followed the DEA. Oh, and yeah. It was fascinating because, you know, they meet five, six o'clock in the morning, right? And they go and they're kicking in somebody's mm -hmm. door and you would watch. And actually, one of the uh, craziest parts is uh, you can go find the house. You can usually even find the person. Mm -hmm. Finding the drugs in many cases oh, yeah. is very difficult yep. to do, even if you have dogs or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it reminded me, uh, I was in the military and, and uh, before we went to Iraq, they gave us uh, an entire training kind of module on how to search these homes and so you go into essentially like a replica home oh yeah and you're practicing you're practicing yeah. and you're like man i'm a genius i found this gun i yeah. found this knife i found this uh -huh. i found this whatever and you get done you got like five or six things and they're like okay come back in with us uh-huh next thing they pull out like 47 weapons oh yeah right they like the floorboard was a Isn't false crazy? floor yep. this and you know you got to move this thing and hey you idiots didn't check underneath the table right. and all of a sudden you just start to realize like there was levels to this and then if oh, yeah. literally your freedom and your economic uh, earning ability is predicated on your ability to hide drugs 100%. or hide the money, yeah, you're going to get creative. Yeah, and the thing is, is if you could, you know, these people are not dumb. If you could put them to use for something legal and good, they're pretty fucking smart.
Mm -hmm. They really are. Like they, they have come up with amazing ways to hide dope, to try to skew the dogs so they can't smell it. You what know, do they do there? Coffee grounds, yeah. motor oil, um, you know, just wrapping it. In, it's, it's pretty fucking genius. And, mm -hmm. you know, the mules that they use, uh, just it, it's ingenious, some of the stuff that they're doing. But, you know, you always have to stay kind of one step ahead of them. And the only way to do that is with CIs or undercovers. Mm-hmm. Because basically you have to have the inside information. You have to. Yeah. You have to. And you said that people had them in the ice cube trays, yeah. in their butt cracks, and the inside of upper their mouths, yeah, and the upper lip. lip. Mm -hmm. uh, where else would they have the drugs usually? Um, Where's the most common area? Is it just so, like in a drawer somewhere? No. So this was actually pretty pretty good because, you know, they always say possessions, nine-tenths of the law. So they had to be in possession of the... Um, narcotics in order to bust them. So what they would do is they would have trash on the side of the road. Looks just like trash. They would hide their dope in bags underneath the trash. So when you came up to buy, they don't have anything on them. Once they felt confident with you, they would pull it out of the trash and then give it to you. So if you went to bust them, they just ran. And if you caught them, they have nothing on their possession. It's all on the street, and you can say, "I wasn't mine." Yeah, it was somebody else did yeah. that out. What yeah, keep exactly. Me? Yeah, it it um uh, it's crazy because I think a lot of people see the videos that go viral online yeah. of the dirty cops planting drugs yes. as well, yes. and uh, obviously it happens, right? Yes, There's videos of it, etc. Uh, but. It's always these weird things where you can't let the few bad apples, or even if there's a lot of bad apples, ruin the people who are doing good work. But yeah. at the same time, to your point, the problem may be so crazy mm -hmm. that the entire approach to trying to solve the problem is wrong. And we have to step back and kind of think about, hey, there may be a different way to address this. And it isn't necessarily kind of in this abrasive, we're going to arrest you, we're going to put you in a cell, yeah. all that. It may just be, look, we're going to let you guys do this, but we are going to make it economically painful I agree. You know, it, we've been doing the same thing for a hundred years and it's not working. Like mm -hmm. at what point do we realize this is insanity? We yeah. need, we need to switch of what we do, but also, you know, there is a set of rules that we play by, you know, law enforcement has a more stringent set of rules than drug dealers do, but drug dealers even have a set of rules. Like it's very taboo for them to shoot a cop because mm -hmm. they know the wrath of the world is on them at that point. So mm -hmm. You know, we have a set of rules, they have a set of rules, and sometimes those rules get crossed. And uh, I think on both ends, it's the frustration. You know, in the law enforcement, it's what what are we fucking doing here? We're, mm -hmm. we're just every day, I'm clocking in, clocking out, and it's the same people, the same amount of drugs every fucking day. And then from the drug dealer side, it's I have no opportunity, I have no education, I have no ability to make enough money to support my family. And they're preventing me from doing that. So mm -hmm. I, I get both sides. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Um, at what point do you say, hey, I'm done being a cop? Yeah, two, well, uh, 2005. Was so, there a specific incident or it was just kind of you'd been doing it for a while and you want to do something else? Yeah, it was just kind of that light bulb moment with narcotics. Um, and then I'm like, what the fuck? Like this is, you know, uh, a glass ceiling it's you're i'm never i'm just tired of being poor essentially mm -hmm. you know at that point i was 31 years old i have a fucking roommate i'm like what is this you know well, and this is actually an interesting point a lot of people don't realize uh most cops in america do not make that much money oh god i made forty two thousand dollars after seven years yeah now it's, i make that in a day yeah it's like I mean, what the fuck well what's crazy about it is i mean that's basically teachers Right. Very yeah. similar. Yeah. Uh, a lot of firefighters. Right. Yep. I mean, there's like a number of these roles that mm -hmm. I think most people would point out and say, like, hey, that's important for society. You're not getting paid a lot. No, I agree. And teachers. Uh, it's a problem, especially in Florida. Mm -hmm. When you look at what you were getting paid, was that the main driver or things like getting a, pull, a gun pulled on you? In no, the it was the main house? driver. Yeah. It was just I'm like, I can't do this. It was that. And it was. Why, why am I going to continue to do something that's not making a difference and put my life on the line for it and yeah. then have to work for idiots in the same thing? Yeah. It's like, man, this is just a, a trifecta of shit, you know? <laughs> did, did the police chiefs and, and those folks, did they understand what's happening in the street or they were too removed? Oh, fuck no. Yeah. No, they're sitting in their office, you know, chilling, with, chilling and their bodyguards and their media and 
Yeah. yeah, they don't give a shit. There's a uh, story. Uh, I hope I don't get the details wrong, but uh, this guy, Brian Grazer, um, mm -hmm. he's a big Hollywood producer. Uh, he wrote a book um, about uh, what he calls curiosity conversations. So for like 40 years, yeah. he would basically call up or write or whatever, just interesting people that he saw in the news or, or he heard about or whatever. And he'd be like, hey, I'm going to be in your city or you're coming to L.A. or you tell me where to meet you anywhere in the world. But like, I would just like to sit down with you and learn from you. Yeah. And uh, I can't really offer you that much. But like, let's just have a conversation because I'm curious yeah. about like your, your life. Yeah. And uh, the way he tells the story is I think it was the day the Rodney King riots started in L.A. Mm. He had a meeting set that morning with the L.A. police chief. Oh. And he was like, for sure, they're canceling this. Nope. He went to the police station, went up, and he spent like 30 minutes or an hour, or whatever it was, with the police chief. Whoa. And he was like, it was one thing to talk to the police chief, right? It was another thing to talk to him uh, about situation happening outside. But he was like, but the most curious part was seeing what was happening inside that room while there was chaos outside. He was like, it was cool, calm, and collected. Wow. And so, like, you hear it, and again, you know, he's writing this years later, and, yeah, and yeah. so there's kind of uh, the memory or whatever, but, like, it's interesting because you you see this, like, very different... Uh, They're very insulated. Re ...remembering of the situation. Yeah. And, like, if you, I, I'm guessing if you were to talk to a street cop in L.A. during those oh, riots... Yeah. They're not cool, calm, and collected, right? Oh, They're dealing no. with a whole different situation. Oh, yeah. Yeah, pretty crazy. I think that, you know, it's... It's all over the media now because everybody and their mother has a camera. It still happened 20, 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. Just nobody had cameras back then. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember we were supposed to take pictures of domestic violence incidents of injuries. And I'll never forget the department couldn't even afford a fucking camera. We got grants from domestic violence organizations that gave us Polaroids shitty polaroids that we took pictures with and that's what and we did for our we had physical. to hold on to the physical picture and turn those in as evidence now my five-year-old has a fucking cell phone <laughs> you know what i mean like <laughs> i didn't even have that when i was 23 yeah yeah that's crazy yeah and so when you go to leave you knew that you wanted to start uh servicing and cleaning and, and i, I started those? it before i left okay explain so i asked the department i said this I had switched departments at the time. I went to this kind of fucking small Mayberry bullshit department and they prevented us from working off duty. I'm like, God, talk about insult to injury here. You're paying us shit and then you're preventing us from making any more money. And why did they not want you to do that? Control. It was just systematically control. So I said, hey, I'm not working off duty in law enforcement, but I want to clean up crime scenes. And they f they were like, okay, well, as long as you don't do it in our city, then it's no conflict. You can do it. Perfect. No problem. Two months went by and they were like, uh, hey, we changed our mind. Um, it's either the job or the business. And I was like, fuck off. And I quit. Really? Yep. I Why said, do you think they changed their mind? Control. Probably making a lot of money. Yeah. And so to start it's off. one of these things of, it's all control. Hey, she, she, uh, she seems to be successful. We didn't care when she yeah, wasn't being successful. Exactly. We didn't care when she wanted to, you know, sell fucking blow pops on the street. But yeah. now that she's making real money, yeah, yeah, we, yeah. Want, we want to curb that. Got it. And so how did you get started? Uh, you know, I lied to the bank. Okay. And I, because uh, they wouldn't give me a loan. And okay. I said that I wanted uh, new windows for my house. So I took a home equity loan of 15 grand. That's okay. all they would give me. So I started out door to door. Just going to apartments and hotels and funeral homes and... That's how I got my first jobs. And do you remember the first one? Yeah. Uh, the first one was a um, double homicide on Christmas Day. Wow. Yeah. Relatives. They so just they killed each other. Fucking had it out. Yeah. Like a okay corral yeah, shootout I mean, in a house. Whatever happened to let's go in the backyard and fucking fight it out. Oh, yeah. no. Let's pull guns and fucking shoot each other. Yeah. yeah. So uh, the mom that's of one, one of them hired it. me and- She's sitting at her kitchen table and I'm fucking cleaning up the blood from. And you're doing it. Yeah, by myself. And uh, there was so much blood that it leaked into the um, pantry, went through the baseboards, the drywall, into the seal plate. I'm like, motherfucker, my first job couldn't be simple. Yeah. No, it's got to be horrendous. <laughs> and when you showed up that first time, you have like hazmat suit on and everything? Yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah. So you pretty much, you know what the game yeah, is. Yeah, I was trained at that point and I was ready to go. I had all, I had 
the basic equipment that I could afford with the 15 mm -hmm. grand, my blood, va I call it a blood vacuum, it's a HEPA vacuum, personal protective equipment, respirators, you know, gloves, disinfectant, all that shit. When you say trained, like you went to like a school? I or went to police? a school. Yeah, no, they don't do that. I went to a private school. It was, it's no longer there, but it was a company in uh, Dallas, Texas. Got it. So you go time. and they basically teach you how to do this. Yeah, they taught me how to do the actual physical operational part of it. They didn't teach me any business. How do you price this? Who's yeah, your yeah. clients? You know, that kind of shit. And when you get there, how long does it take you to clean a double homicide? Fuck. Well, it, it took me about two and a half days. Now I could probably do it in about six hours. Yeah, that's yeah. crazy. Yeah, it was a lot. It was, I mean, two bodies. That's a lot of blood. Mm-hmm. And as you're doing it, like... Mom's just, just sitting there at the fucking kitchen table watching me. I was like, okay, this is fucking weird. Talk about feeling like you're under a microscope. But, you know, after all these years, I've gone through to where some people, I think they find it therapeutic. Mm -hmm. And they want to watch me clean it up. Other people are like, I'm fucking leaving. Call me when you're done. Mm -hmm. And that's the majority. But, you know, I've ha I had one where dad was... Um, he had cancer. He didn't want to be a burden to anybody. He was probably in his 70s. So he put a pillow over his head and shot himself. And the adult daughter hired us. So we're in there. You know, it's pretty cut and dry. It's on the pillow. It's on the, the mattress. And we're cleaning it up. And I find a piece of his jaw in the uh, on top of the mattress underneath the pillow. And she sees me. She insisted on watching she sees me pick it up, and before I could throw it in the red bag, she says, oh, no, 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 don't do that. And I'm like, okay. She's like, I want it. I'm like, I didn't know what to do. I was like, what the fuck? What do I do? So I was like, okay, and I give it to her. I come back the next day to finish the job, and she's wearing it around her fucking neck. What? It's jewelry. Her father's jaw? Yeah. I mean... <laughs> Dude, I've never been in that situation, so like I feel like I, I can't was like, judge, what but I kind of fuck. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. is that the craziest thing that you've seen a family member do? Uh, it's fucking up there. Let me tell you. What are some other ones? Uh, you know, I had a guy once that called me from Michigan, and he said, "Hey, my mom died," and he was just fucking real, like plain about it. No sadness, no nothing. My mom died. Um. Can you go clean it up? Yeah. What happened? I don't know. She decomposed. I'm like, God damn. Okay. So I go over there and I look at it and she had been there for a fucking long while. She smelled the high heaven down the street. And I was like, okay, you know, it's going to be whatever amount it was. And he's like, oh, by the way, can you throw everything away inside the house? I'm like, everything? He's like, yeah. And I go, well, do you want me to save the pictures and stuff for you? Like, are you coming down for the funeral? Oh, no, we're going to have her cremated. Just throw it all away. I was like, what the fuck? Like, some people are just, bam. That's crazy. Yeah, that I felt horrible because I'm like, no wonder the lady fucking decomposed. Nobody gave two shits about her. Yeah. And when that happens, like. It's sad. Yeah, but also um, they're there for so long. Like They just break of, down. Yeah, the body just breaks. It does, the body does an amazing job of breaking down quickly. You know, you start decomposing 15 minutes after your heart stops. So, you know, the blood and liquids and everything is going to go out of whatever orifice that, mm -hmm. that it has, you know, and the skin just becomes flaccid. And if they're laying on the floor and the temperature is just not really cold in the room, their skin's going to stick to the floor. We've had to pick up their scalps before because when they remove the body, the whole back of the scalp stayed attached to the floor mm. so you know these are not fun not fun yeah yeah not fun and when you guys go into uh do this now how many people go in is it like one person or no you go in like it's never just two one four? yeah two to three two to three people. two to three for a bio any more than that and you're like stepping on each other yeah yeah it's kind of like ghostbusters like you show up you <laughs> got all your equipment you got your uh yeah basically gear on. Yeah. yeah and when you're in there like Okay, I get the cleaning part. I get the removal of all the stuff. But what are some of the other components that go into the job that people may not understand? Tons of maggots. What does that mean? There's just the maggots. You know, everybody is surprised. Like, wait, well, wait a minute. The, how did the maggots get in? Well, all you have to have is one fly mm -hmm. in there to lay their eggs. 
and then that creates thousands and thousands of maggots. Mm -hmm. And uh, I like to say that these maggots are my best employees. You know, they're eating up the scene. I don't even have to pay them. And they never call in sick. <laughs> <laughs> and so how do you think about the business now? Like when somebody, when you meet somebody at a coffee shop or something like, oh, what do you do? Oh, they shit themselves. What do you say? They're all, you know, I, it depends. Like if I have I, a cleaning if, company? Well, if I'm in the mood to chat, um, I'll say, you know, I'm a crime scene cleaner. And they'll be like, what the fuck? What's yeah. the craziest thing you ever saw? Everybody always so asks me. that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, if I'm not in the mood to chat, I'm just like, oh, I own a cleaning company. And they're like, oh, she's a janitor. Whatever. Yeah. Well, yeah. Whatever you want to think, man. <laughs> That's fine. I'm a janitor yeah. that does $18 million a exactly. year. I've got 85% profit margin. <laughs> Shut the fuck yeah. up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, when you think about this business, is there an opportunity to go and get the government contracts or is, it wouldn't be that uh, lucrative? So there is, but it's very strategic. So certain cities have the ability to have contracts. Miami happens to be one of them. Mm. Miami's the only city in Florida that has a, a, the availability for a contract. So you have uh, pretty much the entire state of California, surprise, surprise, has the ability to have that. Um, and then it's- That sounds like there's zero uh, corruption or oh, yeah. other things going on. Well, as if with, with everything, right? Yeah. So uh, there is, it really depends on geography. Mm. And you all have built a huge name for yourself through social media, Yes. which uh, when people think of social media, I think they think of influencers, consumer brands, maybe technology companies. You guys are cleaning up crime scenes. Yeah. Uh, but you got a million subscribers on YouTube. Yeah. You have tens of thousands on Facebook. I don't know how many you have on Instagram or other platforms, yeah. but it's a lot. Yeah. Why did you think to go onto the internet from a social media and marketing perspective? So for two reasons. Uh, the first one was, remember when I first started, I everybody thought the police cleaned it up. Mm -hmm. So I knew I had that hurdle to overcome. And I thought, what is the way to reach the masses? And this was easy. It was free. Mm -hmm. And it gave us the ability to essentially tell people, police don't do this. Mm. If you don't hire it out, you're doing it. You mm -hmm. know, it's it's you as the property owner does it. And number two, we got a shit ton of inquiries of this is fascinating. Like, how do you do this or how do you do that or true crime? Like, every, you know, that's mm -hmm. kind of the big thing now. So I knew that we would hit two needs uh, just by posting the videos. So we took an educational approach where we don't hide anything like, you know, nothing's proprietary. It's not fucking rocket scientists. Right. Mm -hmm. So we're saying, hey, this is what we're doing. This is why we're doing it. And this is how we're doing it. Mm -hmm. And it took off. Mm -hmm. And like, are you like, hey, here's how you clean a scalp up off a wood yeah, floor? Yeah, totally. And you explain like- Absolutely. The materials you use or whatever. Absolutely. And are people just like masochists? Uh, are they yeah. just like weirdos? Like, no, I think people- want to watch? People are enamored with curiosity, right? Mm -hmm. You're always curious about something that you don't see every day or something. Wow, that's interesting. I had no idea, mm -hmm. right? And I think people kind of have a morbid curiosity with what happens to you when you die. Mm -hmm. Do we really even know the answer to that mm -hmm. other than we decompose and nobody knows what mm -hmm. happens after that? So uh, I think there's a, a huge interest in it. Look at the true crime podcast. Look at the most popular shows on TV. Mm -hmm. They're all either law enforcement or hospital related, right? Mm -hmm. So people are curious about it. And have you ever had content taken down off any of the platforms? I think so. I think uh, TikTok is a one that their, <laughs> their rules change um with the wind so uh every once in a while we will get um community violation or something like that we'll just remove it what type of content they don't allow any gore whereas the other platforms love gore <laughs> yeah. so you really just have to know who your who your platform is yeah what what is the definition of gore like yeah well no blood no body parts. I mean, I see the inflation numbers and that looks gory to me. That's exactly correct. <laughs> yes. That should be right. a crime to post that. <laughs> like, like if yes. we're just going to have an open, opaque definition exactly. of gore, then like, let's start exactly. there. I, I would agree with you there. Yeah. All right. <laughs> and uh, as, you, as you have been posting, is there a specific type of content that really takes off with the audience? Yes. It's typically the death related <laughs> or hoarding. Hoarding. Those two are what we, we used to post everything. Now we're only posting those two service verticals. Okay. And what do you do around hoarding? Uh, they love to see what people hoard, what becomes, becomes of their homes, 
What becomes of them? What are they hoarding? Some animals hoard animals. Some hoard trash. It's some... like they just don't take their trash out? Ever. Not only do they not take their trash out, they're going to go through your trash and bring that shit into their house. For what purpose? Because they like it. They're trash people. Yeah. Yeah. Mess. Or they, ha you know, they have seven vacuums. Six don't work, but I'm going to keep the six because it has parts for the one that does work. Oh. Makes sense? Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. of course. Of course. Because the first five don't have parts either. Right. <laughs> Man. <laughs> There's some weird people out there. Yeah. Everybody's got I, their I own I always thought tick. there should be a show. Uh, in New York City, where yeah. they just showed people's apartment, like surprise style. Yeah. And they were like MTV Cribs. Yeah. But like you haven't cleaned. You don't know they're coming. And just like people would be enamored by like how weird fucking people are. Oh, yeah. Totally. Right. And yeah. just like, hey, knock, knock. Can you know, that would people would not let them in because the first time that somebody, some camera crew walked in and was like, oh, shit, there's four dildos over there. You know, they'd be like, oh, fuck. Yeah. But, <laughs> but. I think that there's some people who are super weird who are proud. They want people to know. Perhaps, weird. yeah. Like I always just think of uh, uh, like the guy who probably has like 16 parrots. Yeah. He's like, come on in. Look, there's yeah. Larry and Rob and, yeah. and Dan. Right. <laughs> like, we eat doing? together. We yeah. bathe together. Yeah. Look, I taught him this trick. Yeah. Right? We shit together. <laughs> we, yeah. <laughs> and so you look at it. You're like, okay, like those types of people would definitely love it. Oh yeah. And then there's the people who are doing real weird stuff. Yeah. Like, oh, I'm, yeah. I'm good. Exactly. And then you're like, what? Well, can we pay you? Yeah. Like, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> like, there like, you we go. We definitely want to come there to your you place. I, I found that people have. Um, you know, they're adamant. Oh, no, don't film me. Don't film me. But what if we pay you? Oh, okay. Yeah, come in. <laughs> so, uh, you know, their threshold changes when you offer them money. Do you have to get approval? When you we do. Film? We do. We get approval with everyone. And is it just like, hey, if you if you uh, work with us, we're going to film? Yeah. It's, and you know, we're, we could use this for marketing and educational purposes. Mm -hmm. And you can say yes or no. Yeah. Then Will sweat. you still do the job if they say no? Of course, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. basically, it's you ask everyone, but some people say no. Yeah. And do the people who say no ever have like weird shit going on? Or it's like, nah, I just I don't want to. Usually if they say no, it's it's due to a suicide. Interesting. Yeah. They're, they're, uh, which, you know, has always perplexed me okay. that you would feel more um, private about a suicide than you would about an unattended death. Me personally, I would be, and this is no shame on anybody else, but I would feel embarrassed if a family member died unattended because that mm. would mean that nobody ever checked on them. Mm. Whereas a suicide is, I view it as a very personal choice. Mm -hmm. That was the individual's choice and it's their life and they can do whatever the fuck they want with it. Yeah. Um, but most people that decline, it's always a suicide. Suicide. Yeah. Because there's uh, intimacy to it or yes. whatever. Yeah. It's, it, it, absolutely crazy. Yeah. Um, what else about the business that people may not realize that like would be interesting? Labor is difficult. Yeah. Other than the physical demands of the labor. Yeah. What else, what well, else you know, I think labor in general in America is is going to shit in a handbasket. Yeah. Um, Blue collar wise, and I'm I'm not I'm not only seeing that with our type of business, but you know I'm hearing it from plumbers, AC people, contractors, you name it. It's just it's a change in our work ethic, and everybody wants a shit ton of money to do as little as possible. And um, me too. Yeah, don't we all? Right. <laughs> but if you don't have the skill set for that, you're not going to get that. Yeah. I'm joking for those yeah. that are listening or yeah. watching. Um, and do you think that that is just a like cultural I think it's cultural. Thing? Yeah, I do. I've seen the change since I first started 18 years ago. Um, and, you know, we've actually tested some different things. We've we've tested paying brand new off the street. Guy doesn't even have a, a high school diploma. 15 bucks an hour. We've tried paying him 25 an hour all the way up to 35. And we got the same quality of employee with mm. Three very different pay rates. Mm -hmm. What would you say the average employee you have now? College educated, high school educated, no high school education. How old are they? Like high school only it. in their twenties. High school only in their twenties, and mm -hmm. so this is something where hey, I don't have tons of options. They don't, and so 
this is a good option because it probably pays decently well compared yes. to my other options. Right. Uh, and I don't have to have a degree or right. all this other stuff. But here's the deal. They get in, they start working for about 90 days and they're like, okay, I know I'm making $20 an hour, but this shit's fucking hard. I'm just going to go to Mickey D's and make 15 mm. and work just fucking flipping burgers. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the mentality that's kind of happened now. So we're really kind of in a conundrum here of, mm -hmm. of finding good talent that's going to stay. How do you do that? I don't know. I don't have the secret yet. How often do the employees turn over? About every six months. Every six months? Yeah. That's real short. Yeah, it is. And it's so not near as short as a McDonald's employee. I feel their pain. Mm -hmm. uh, but with ours, it's more expensive because the we're giving, yeah, the training is expensive. The inoculations um, uniforms, you know, the fit testing and all that kind of stuff. It's expensive. You guys have to do physical fitness testing? <sighs> uh, respirator fit test and the physical, of like mm -hmm. an actual physical. Yeah, like you yeah, went that, to play that, football or whatever. Yeah, that's what I mean. It's yeah. basically you, you're testing the physical yeah. uh, fitness or, or right. whatever of the Can individual. you breathe with a respirator on? Just different, like yeah. a lot of people can't do that. P people don't know what that is. <laughs> they don't know what that is. Yeah, you go through the gas chamber, right? <laughs> yeah. The um, uh, I, I was uh, talking to uh, a friend that was on the show, and uh, he's a Navy SEAL. There's all this controversy now about how the SEALs are getting treated during their training. And as you can imagine, most of the SEALs are like, uh, yeah. okay. Yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, wait, wait till you hear what happens after yeah, the training. Yeah, no shit. Um, but uh, one of the things that anyone uh, in the Army or in the Navy usually goes through is these gas chambers. And yep. so uh, we, were, we were joking after the show that people think you go into the gas chamber with the gas mask on. No. And then you walk out <laughs> and like, it's just like to yeah. test. Yeah. And we were like, if only the public somehow figured out that, no, they make you take the gas mask off, talk, open yeah. your eyes. Say like, your social, your phone number, yeah, all like that shit. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And then they make you put the gas mask back on and yeah. people come out and they got snot coming snot out. Snot ringing out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and he was like. So yeah, uh, gas chamber's fine, yeah. right? Like, like yeah. almost if people actually knew the details, they'd be even more pissed. Oh yeah. But a respirator, you're not necessarily uh, doing that type of stuff, but it's very hard to breathe. To your point, it is. It's um, it's very taxing, and you know, my biggest issue with it is, well, there's two. The cartridges tend to carry a little bit of weight to them. Yes. So my neck at the end of the day is fucking on fire. Mm -hmm. Um, and secondly, my peripheral vision is fucking shot. So when somebody's like, you know, swinging a hammer back there, I can't see it. I can't see it. And you have to wear the respirator and all the uh, protective equipment because you kind of don't know what you're... You have no idea what's in there. And I don't want, you know, hepatitis, you know, mm -hmm. touching my skin, you know, C. diff, MRSA. There's just a ton of shit um, that you, you have to protect yourself against. Mm -hmm. What's the most fun part of doing this now you've been doing it for 18 years? That it's different every day. What's the worst part? You just whatever you just thought you should say. Well, I, I'm, I'm thinking I would say working in confined spaces. Mm. Like, uh, like claustrophobic? Yeah, I had a guy that shot himself in the attic with a shotgun. And uh, fucking attic. Like an unfinished attic. Super small. Yeah. And I'm walking up the stairs because the, the cops were still there. And they're like, oh, he's up in the attic. You know, you can go take a look or whatever. And I get up to the second floor. And his blood is dripping down the wall on the second floor from the attic. So it looked like the shining going in. And I'm like, oh, wow, it's fresh, like real fresh. And it's clearly a lot of fucking blood up there. So I go up there and he's still up there. And all I could see was about this much of his scruff. And his face is just blown off. His eyeball is shot into the air vent. And his jaw, like just fucking everything, God, right? Yeah. It's just everywhere. And the blood is just dripping down. So not only are you cleaning the attic now, you're cleaning the fucking second floor, which yeah. is a finished living space. Yeah. So it's it's challenging. Yeah. Um, when you think back to the start of the business, what mm -hmm. do you wish you knew that you know now? So much. Like I probably lost a shit ton of money. Oh, I know I did. I lost a shit ton of money the first three years in business because no one taught me how do you quote this? How do you bill this? How do you, how do you charge for this? Like it was literally just kind of cowboys and Indians like, uh, yeah, that sounds good. You know, and I mm -hmm. way, way undercharged. I was lucky enough to have an insurance adjuster 
pull me aside like three years later and go, hey, I'm not supposed to tell you this, but you way undercharge. I'm like, fucking hey, are you serious? Yeah. He's like, you should be charging double. It's like, wow. Oh, fuck. For the same amount of work. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty crazy. Yeah. Because there's just nothing to go off of. It's not like, you know, plumbing. I know what a, a, a typical like tra travel charge is or whatever. Mm. With this, it's totally out totally of the blue. Different. Yeah. Um, I know that you get a lot of inspiration from other industries or mm -hmm. other businesses. How do you go about finding those inspirations or those ideas that you then can bring into an industry that, frankly, there's just not that many people do or know about? Yeah, so I, I always look outside industries and particularly real estate investment kind of uh, for my ideas, especially with marketing. So we have to be kind of strategic about how we market. And um, about five years ago, I came up with bandit signs. I'm like, man, they, they do that everywhere for real estate and it works. So let's try that. Let's try that. So we kind of deployed that in all of our markets and we tested kind of different type of things. Well, not only did we get service calls for it, we got employees out of it. Mm. Oh my God, crime scene cleaning. I want to do that. Are you hiring? Like, you know, people were kind of enamored with that. So I kind of got that idea from there. Um, software ideas I get from there too. Um, you know, like CRMs, automation, just things like mm -hmm. that. They're, they're, that industry is very good at that. Mm -hmm. um, and we can't do a traditional billboard you know, uh, buy one, get one free, you know, any newspaper ad, you can't do, do anything like that, but radio ad. Hey, if yeah. a family member has passed away. Yeah. yeah. If you see something dripping through your second floor, call yeah. us. Yeah. You can't really do that. So it, it's been uh, a test, you know, and when I first started out, I did that billboard thing, lost a shit ton of money because it mm -hmm. never worked, mm -hmm. but I, it was almost like throwing darts at a dartboard and seeing what stuck. Mm -hmm. Um, but as I grew, I was able to kind of say, okay, let's take different industries and see what's working for them and see if that there's a possibility that that could work with us. Mm -hmm. And social media was one of those. Mm -hmm. Outside of the bank loan, did you have to take any money to grow the business? No. Yeah. You well, I tried. That. No one ever gave me any money. <laughs> Ain't that a bitch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I tried to get a lot of um, bank loans, uh, you know, things like that. The only thing that I've ever gotten was a mortgage for our building. Mm -hmm. And when you look at that, is that actually a blessing in disguise now? Not really. Because okay. I feel like I could have grown twice as fast in a shorter period of time. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, perhaps exited, gone into a different type of industry and, mm -hmm. you know, just kind of rinse and repeat. Mm -hmm. But I've been doing this for 18 years. That's mm -hmm. that's a bit long. Yeah. <laughs> my, uh, my last question for you. Yeah. Are you still having fun? Yes, I am having fun with uh, various aspects of it. You know, I, I have a lot of fun with the social media side of it because I think it's just it's so ripe for, mm -hmm. for anything, you know, and, uh, it, it cracks me up when most business owners are like, Oh my God, you have to be so PC. You have to watch what you say, watch what you do. I'm like, fuck, no, you don't. Mm -hmm. We do whatever we want. We don't censor shit. If you don't like it, don't fucking watch the channel. Mm -hmm. You know, that's just really what it is. And, mm -hmm. uh, businesses are too focused on being sterile and mm -hmm. we're not. I think that is a great piece of advice for a lot of people. <laughs> I do. Yeah. Cutting through the noise, mm -hmm. right? If you act, talk, and uh, kind of conduct yourself the way everyone else does, it's Absolutely. real hard to stand out. Absolutely. Where can we send people to find you on the internet or find out more about the business? Well, if you like watching gore, you can go to YouTube at Crime Scene Cleaning. Uh, we just passed a million subs on that, so we're super excited about that. Um, we're on TikTok as well, Crime Scene Cleaning. We got about 5 million there, Instagram, Facebook. You know, we're kind of all over the place. And if we're, we're actually starting a subscription site on our crime scene cleaning website, crimescenecleaning.com for um, kind of behind the scenes, super gory videos that we wouldn't make it on on social. I can't wait to hear <laughs> how many people sign up for yeah, that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Your own personal gross room, right? Absolutely. And then do you have anything personally that uh, people should follow? Yeah, I've got a I've got a book getting ready to come out here uh, probably in a few months. We just got signed with an agent on that. So I'm working on that. Um, we're uh, kind of in talks with maybe a reality show mm -hmm. going on here. And um, I'm on Facebook as well and, you know, LinkedIn and all that other kind of stuff. Laura Spaulding. Awesome. Well, I appreciate it very much. I really enjoyed this conversation. I learned a lot. Uh, <laughs> didn't know uh, the economics of uh, street bus <laughs> or, or crime scene cleaning, yeah. but uh, we'll definitely do this again in the future. Yeah, thanks for having me.